uh, in the future. Uh, oh, I got that one backwards because at the beginning of these, I know that like people haven't trickled in to watch the live yet. So I'm only speaking yeah. to people that have watched the recording. So what I meant to say was, hello, people of the future. I'm here from the past. And as always, I am Derek, the community steward here at ETH Denver, a.k.a. Spork Dow. Branding's hard. <laughs> yep. Past, present, and future. Something and all like of that. us are welcome here, wherever, whatever you know, time zone you're in, whatever part of the four-dimensional time-space continuum you're a part of, you're welcome here right now. And speaking of people that are welcome, I'm joined here by Josh today. Hi, Josh. Hey, nice to meet you, Derek. Nice, nice to meet to you, here. too. So um, today on Theory Thursdays, we're going to continue solidifying our fundamentals. We want to make sure whether you're a developer, a designer, a student, whatever your background is, whatever your interest level is, whatever your knowledge level is, Theory Thursdays is for you because we are going to start from the beginning. We're going to make no assumptions about what you know. And like you don't need to know what a hash is. You don't need to know what a consensus mechanism is. Like this is really breaking it down and explaining some of the high level ideas in terms that you could explain ideally to like a family member over dinner and just be like, well, mm -hmm. here's the goal of this thing. Here's how we tried to accomplish it. And like a, with a broad stroke. And so I'm excited because today Josh and I are going to get into Celestia and Celestia is the hallmark of a modular blockchain. So by the end of this discussion, you'll understand a little bit more what a blockchain tries to do. Like if your current mental model is like a blockchain is like a computer, right? Like, great. That's a fantastic place to start. And we're going to get into what computers do, the difference between something like computation and storage and talk about how Celestia has an approach that attempts to solve some of what we're seeing on like Ethereum mainnet, for example, like congestion, high gas fees, really slow uh, like throughput. These are problems caused by the current infrastructure. And so we're going to try to explain how Celestia has one potential solution to that, basically by breaking it up into pieces or modules. So that's what modular means. I'm doing your job, Josh. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get into the details. <laughs> sure, enough. but I want to so, just... So that sets you know, the stage well. This is like a tell them where you're going, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So here in yeah. the beginning, I want to let you all know that today we're going to talk about how blockchains work. And then Celestia is going to give us an interesting angle in on how they work and how they are attempting to break apart the pieces and put them back together in a different way that has certain advantages. So without further ado, um, let's take a complete detour because just like uh, Celestia is modular and has different pieces, so do you too have a lot of pieces going on in your life. You're not just, are, are you DevRel or Dev Advocate? Yeah, uh, solutions engineer. Like solutions is that? I'm on the DevRel team. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm on the DevRel team. What is uh, a solutions so engineer? I work a lot on integrations. Uh, as more people want to build rollups, um, I also uh -huh. do a lot of documentation uh, and and this sort of thing. Oh, okay. So yeah. public facing, like with the folks that yeah, are trying yeah. to use the tech and building on top. Yeah. Interesting. Kind of like an integrations. Yeah. So. Yeah, th this is Greek to me. Um, uh, we're going to start as we always do. I'm going to pin, uh, I'm going to force Josh to tell us his life story because I think it's more interesting to know who people are than to just dive into like, well, you'll never believe our new SDK. So <laughs> to <Yeah>. that end, <laughs> Josh, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about how you got here like, well, to be yeah, a solutions absolutely. engineer at Celestia? What is that path? Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to go too far back, but I do think it's important to like highlight um, I had a pretty math and science heavy upbringing, uh, educationally or academically. Um, so I went to a STEM focused high school, uh, ended up going to university for mechanical engineering, uh, and in what seems like a common, uh, fashion for people in crypto, I took a detour. I actually worked in restaurants. Uh, beginning like washing dishes, I ended up managing kitchens for about two and a half years. Uh, I then decided during the pandemic to go back to school. One of the things that uh, resurfaced from my STEM heavy high school was really, I had this deep desire to learn how to build websites. I had mm. done like WordPress sites, I had done uh, like Squarespace and sort of the no code tools to build sites before. But uh, as I was finishing school, uh, finishing a business degree, actually, 
I started to get really curious. Uh, so I started playing around with Gatsby JS. I did a tutorial on their site that taught me how to build something from scratch for the first time. And that was kind of where it all like clicked. And I realized I wanted to go in a different direction. I studied supply chain management in business school, um, but realized that wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. Uh, so I was working with a nonprofit in Boston, actually, as I was finishing my degree as well and doing some website management for them. Uh, fortunately, I was with uh, a lot of engineers working on that project, and they kind of encouraged me to start looking uh, at this different path. So that's really ultimately what led me in the direction of working in traditional tech. Uh, I guess like I was working on an AWS uh, course to be, I uh, actually forget exactly the, the role, but was getting a certification for that. Uh, and then I was scrolling on Twitter one day on the weekend and I came across developer DAO and I was like, wow, this looks fun. Uh, I'd kind of been like exploring the NFT scene uh, that summer. So this is back in like October ish, 2021, right around when developer DAO had first taken off. Uh, and I joined, I minted a token. I joined the discord server. Uh, it seemed a lot more fun and exciting than what was going on. Uh, I mean, at Amazon, uh, it wasn't really that, that appealing. <laughs> I had friends that worked for them and they were like, yeah, they don't really care about who you are. And I guess after like a few years of working in kitchens, I really just wanted to be able to enjoy myself and be myself. So that was a big thing uh, that drew me into like the Web3 crypto world. Uh, so I actually signed up for a build space project that day that I discovered developer DAO. Um, there were a lot of people in the server that were using that to learn how to build things. So I ended up doing a few projects there uh, and that was kind of what got me going down the rabbit hole. Uh, so I actually went to ETH Denver last year. Uh, I was looking for work at the time still and man, there were just like endless options in terms of what I could do with uh, like my business background, but also my tech like interest in learning about all of this. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what kicked it off for me about a year ago. Uh, after ETH Denver, I worked at Anchor and KR uh, Infrastructure as a service provider, and now I'm at Celestio. And I guess very briefly was a teaching assistant with BuildSpace uh, part-time uh, last winter. That's fun. So yeah, wow. it's definitely not been a straight path, but um, it's all worked out and I'm loving what I do. So Wow. Uh, a, lot, a lot of parallels to my path, actually. Yeah, yeah. I ended up um, around that August, October 21 time. I mean, many of us are members of the 2020 Bull Run cohort, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I also find it interesting that since then, DeveloperDAO, because you joined and you found BuildSpace and started practicing, since then, DeveloperDAO has launched DD Academy, even. They they have yep. their own like in-house version of the same. Uh, and it's just really heartening to hear that many of us find a foothold just scrolling through Twitter, finding a community that looks fun, going and hanging out in the Discord server, and then the rest is history. Yep. That's and it very very often how it happens and then a launching point of course like uh, your first irl event whether it's in ETH denver yeah. or something else closer to you there's this like oh you're from dd oh my god oh let me introduce you to this person and then suddenly the networking just starts to unfold yeah absolutely and i guess it was a perfect uh, storm in the sense that we were all home during that time and hanging out in discord was something that was completely okay yeah um, that's a great point yeah it's been a good time so um, you found some purchase, you worked at Anchor, you helped out at BuildSpace as a teaching assistant, and now you're at Celestia. What is Celestia trying to do? Like, what is at a high level, what is it, and how does it fit into the current landscape of where the blockchain ecosystem is and is trying to go? Absolutely. Uh, so Celestia is the first modular blockchain network, uh, and we'll get a lot more into the details about what that means here shortly, but... At a high level, um, the way that I first understood it, what we're doing is basically breaking apart the different functions of a blockchain or modules, as you described briefly in the beginning. And we're making it so that anyone can specialize each one of those layers for whatever their use case is. 
Um, at the core, though, what we're building is a shared security layer, which will handle consensus and data availability, which are two of the common core functions of a blockchain. So the real goal here is to allow anyone to deploy a rollup uh, for their sovereign community. And by using a shared security layer, it makes bridging easier. And the trust assumptions are uh, basically the same across the different chains that are built on top of Celestia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this... but I think I think the slides will help. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely this a do. lot better. <laughs> and, and before yeah. I forget, I've, I forgot to add this piece to to reflect on your story. I also find it interesting that you left AWS essentially, or or learning about it, to yeah. um, join Developer DAO, and then that was like a springboard. Nather Dobbit, who essentially founded Developer DAO because he released yeah. the NFTs for free in the style of the um, what were they loot loot? Yep. I was gonna um, say shout out Nader. Yeah, shout out Nader for sure. Yeah. He was on stream a couple <laughs> weeks ago, like actual yeah. hero of mine. It was his birthday recently. Um, he also sort of left a AWS to like pivot into Web three. So I think there's a little just fun symmetry there. Between yeah, the path <laughs> and his path. If I may draw that parallel. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let me get away with it. So let's yeah. go ahead. If you have some slides, um, visuals, yeah, of absolutely. course, um, can help a lot with, with these things because we're talking about, hi, Alana, extremely uh, technical stuff. Ooh, behind the scenes. And uh, in order to do that, let's start at the beginning. We're going to have some definitions. We're going to have some diagrams. We have the hard job. Josh and I both have uh, different versions of a teaching background, and we it is our sincere goal to help you understand really technical things at an approachable level. And so here we go. Yeah. I'm ready. Uh, if we're, we got the screen up. Yeah, we're good to go whenever you're ready. Nice. Cool. So today we're going to be talking about, or tonight, today, whatever it is for you, Celestia. And Celestia is the first modular blockchain network. Um, I think we already covered most of this. Um, I'm a solutions engineer at Celestia Labs. Uh, and at the core, we're a, a modular data availability layer one blockchain. I was previously at Anchor in build space. Um, I am a GM emoji stan. I use it everywhere. I love it. Uh, and then I guess developer DAO. Uh, that, again, that's that's what really started it all for me. Shout outs to Didi. Amazing crew. Yeah. Thank you, Natter David. So... Going over the agenda, uh, we're going to first talk about what a modular blockchain is and break that apart into four core functions. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. Then we're going to talk about Celestia. And then we're going to talk about Rollkit, uh, which is the hot new SDK that we kind of hinted at earlier. And then we're going to go over deploying your own EVM, uh, so Ethereum virtual machine rollup that's going to be using Celestia as a shared security layer. So someone will know that they've really got what we're going on, we're going over today, if they could explain what AI, AII, B, and C mean. If they understand these think so. functions of a blockchain and could it do like a one-liner version of like, oh, what does execution mean? Blah, blah, blah. So somebody's like really good to go if they could explain each of these. Yeah, absolutely. And we won't go too deep into settlement um, but on the execution side, uh, we're going to be, yeah, going into that. Okay. So starting out, uh, really, like, what is a modular blockchain? I'm going to let that sit for a second. Because <laughs> it's a new concept. <laughs> a, modular blockchain, <laughs> a modular blockchain uh, is a blockchain that decouples the core functions, so it breaks apart the core functions of a blockchain uh, and typically, that those functions are execution, settlement, consensus, and data availability. But like, what does that all actually mean? So one way to think about this um, is with the OSI model for software development. Uh, basically, what I want to get out of this slide is the things that we use today, uh, Twitter, Instagram, email, like streaming and all of that, it's not all happening on one software stack. Uh, there's multiple pieces that build that to make it more efficient uh, so that you can reduce bottlenecks. 
So I think this is a good comparison that we can use to understand modular blockchains. Basically, we've seen this progression of blockchain technology go from a monolithic era where execution and consensus are tightly coupled. So basically the blockchain is doing everything and this often causes bottlenecks. Uh, so high transaction fees, low throughput. And what we're doing uh, in the modular software era is decoupling execution and consensus at the software level. But that requires you to create an entire validator network. Um, so basically creating your own shared security layer. And we'll get into the details of that in a little bit of why that isn't necessarily the best solution, at least as far as we're understanding this. And the modular blockchain era is where we're going to split apart all of the functions and then build on top of a shared security layer so that we can all have the same guarantees for security. So what this looks like in practice, um, we're going we're gonna to go over a few examples. Uh, so there's a few different ways that you could build on top of Celestia or on top of another shared security layer. So the first example would be a sovereign rollup. A sovereign rollup has execution and settlement coupled. And basically, the execution layer is where all the smart contracts live, where all the accounts live. Um, that's what you would see in your wallet. And the smart contracts that you interact with, it's basically what the end user sees. Now, consensus and data availability. Basically, consensus is Derek and I agreeing that we're on the same page if we were nodes. And then data availability is us being able to have the same transaction data. Um, I might be getting ahead of myself, so we'll just go over these examples now and get into the details in a second. So a roll-up, the execution layer would be able to settle onto something else. Uh, this could be Ethereum. And then we also have consensus and DA still handled by Celestia. There's also the idea of a Celestium where execution is done in its own environment and then settled and consensus is settlement and consensus is done on Ethereum. And we're just going to use Celestia for data availability. And I can post links in the chat to more about this uh, for anyone who wants to learn more. So going back a little bit, um, I think it's important to compare the like traditional Web2 cloud stack with the Web3 and modular stack. Uh, in the Web2 world, we have these large data centers where there's a lot of centralized, basically centralization around the way that data is stored and handled and owned. Now in the Web3 modular stack, what we're aiming to do at Celestia is build a data network that anyone can build on top of. And basically, the big thing is shared security. So each one of these DeFi, NFT, DAO, decentralized social could all be their own rollups. And we're going to get into what that looks like. So why Celestia? Modular blockchain sounds fun, uh, but, but what does that actually mean? Anyone, the, the goal of Celestia is to allow anyone to deploy decentralized blockchains without the overhead of bootstrapping a new consensus network. And what this does is it allows you to scale without sacrifice and really just build what you need to build rather than focusing on the base layer. And a big part of this is that people who are building on top of Celestia inherit crypto economic security, which basically protects them from civil attacks and um, yeah, it allows everyone to have the same security. But like, how is this actually possible? Uh, so traditionally we have two different types of blockchain nodes. May, may I pause a, you? Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, cause Alana, the web three girl is, is very actively paying attention and she uh, is is looking forward to you posting uh, more links later, but there was a question um, in related to in relation to this slide, um, and her I'll, I'll go ahead and put it on screen here just so we can all see it. Um, so I could have my own blockchain now, but inherit the security from Ethereum, for example. I think this is in relation to one of the on the previous slide, or yeah, that one. Yeah. 
So uh, Celestium is something that will be enabled by something we're calling the Quantum Gravity Bridge. Okay, sorry. And yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll link you to the blog post there. Great, got it. Uh, that's something that we're still working on. Uh, but yes, ultimately, you can use consensus. Uh, you can settle on Ethereum and have consensus on Ethereum as well. Uh, but I think it, it will help to get into more about like what exactly consensus is and what, what data availability is. Okay. Yeah, let's keep it going. Thank you for asking, Alana. Yeah, thank you, Alana. So taking a step deeper, uh, traditionally we have two types of blockchain nodes. We have full nodes, and full nodes download and verify all the blockchain data. So every block, they download everything, make sure it's valid. And what this causes is a higher barrier to entry, and it really only allows a minority of users to run nodes on the blockchain. Running a node allows you to guarantee security, and what we're working on at Celestia is uh, something called a data availability sampling light node. But before we get into that, uh, a light node is something that only downloads block headers traditionally. It doesn't actually verify the data. And there's a lower barrier to entry, which allows a majority of users to run these light nodes. And then we typically have a uh, we have light clients on Ethereum, but they trust a majority of validators. So you're having high trust assumption that all of the full the validators are being honest, and there's no way to actually check that anything but the header is accurate. Hmm. At Celestia, we're building uh, light nodes that are able to verify the blocks with high security uh, with only by only downloading a small portion of the data. And we'll explain that in a second. Hmm. But like, how light are we talking? Uh, so recently, Code Sandbox released uh, Docker compatibility in their browser, uh, in the application in the browser. And we're actually able to run a light node on there. And they only really have about a few gigs of memory and storage. But we're able to do this on very, very lightweight devices. But what is data availability? So data availability is transaction data that's getting verified for the first time. So in block seven here, we have the newest transactions coming in from everyone. And as a user, what we want to do is verify that the new transaction data is there and that it's available. This one makes sense to me because I'm a user and I'll do a swap yeah. on Uniswap and I just want to know the swap's done so I can go do something with whatever I just swapped for. Yep. I just want and accurate, up-to-date data on the state of how things are. Absolutely. It's yeah, really important, I think, for the user experience to be able to do that quickly, but also accurately. And I think a common misconception with data availability is that it sounds like the same thing as data storage, right? But hmm. data storage is transaction data that's already been verified. So as a user, you're going to be retrieving old transaction data, and these aren't the same thing. So data availability is just transaction data that's getting verified for the first time, and then data storage is transaction data that's already been verified. So I just want to highlight that these are two different things. Um, and we will have data storage, uh, but not on light nodes. So when it comes to scalability, um, I think I mentioned earlier that building your own rollup on top of a shared security layer allows you to scale uh, almost endlessly. In a monolithic chain, uh, the full node downloads the entire block. And if we want bigger blocks, that means we need bigger hardware. Uh, typically, a lot of these full nodes can maybe run on a laptop, but as the blocks get bigger, we're going to need servers, we're going to need data centers, and at the end of the day, this is something that is probably not as scalable as it could be. So in the modular world, we have these light nodes, and they're able to download a small portion of the block. And the more light nodes that you have, the higher guarantee you have that the block is there and that the data is available. 
So as we want bigger blocks, all we need to do is add more light nodes. Uh, and as the network grows, we're able to produce bigger blocks and bigger blocks mean higher throughput and lower transaction fees. So really what we're doing here is allowing networks to scale without requiring more hardware. And then ultimately the goal is to allow these light nodes to run inside of wallets uh, on cell phones and actually make a lot of this technology more accessible by also providing people with the security guarantees that they want. So knowing that your Uniswap uh, tr swap went through. Hmm. I guess I'm going to pause uh, to see if there's any questions. So, so far we're covering data availability and data storage. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we do have a question. Uh, Alon is asking, so you're allowing for decentralization that can be enabled by the user of a blockchain, correct? Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to trust uh, an RPC provider, uh, someone who's going to tell you that the data is there, you're actually able to do that yourself. Uh, and we'll Whoa. play around with it later on. But interesting, something you can do with a light node is actually mm -hmm. also send transactions. Um, wow. Okay. So, yeah. For folks that let's take a step back. Yeah. So when in the current model, if you're using something like a MetaMask or MyEth or Wallet, how does a transaction that you're trying to execute get to the blockchain? Yeah, so it's going to go through, uh, well, unless you're running your own node, it's going to go through uh, an RPC, uh, which is basically a gateway to someone else running a node. Um, so basically what you're doing is trusting a third party yeah, without I'm actually being able to verify that information yourself. Quick node, Infura, yeah, yeah. Um, was the other big one? Alchemy, Anchor. Alchemy, of course, Anchor. Um, Pocket Network is a great one. Pocket. Yeah. But basically, we're, we're just trusting these other parties. And what we want to do is be able to give the users of the blockchain like the first class access um, to be basically the main part of the, the network. Yeah, I think uh, I'm excited for us to keep going because I I don't totally understand like what was given up in, in transitioning to being a light node. Like what is a light node doing? What is it not doing? It, if I have the app open on my phone, in what sense am I contributing? Is it like a peer-to-peer -peer network? And when I turn it off, what happens then? So yep. I think as we continue to define what these different parts are, it'll be a little more clear to me at least like what these nodes are and are not doing. Yeah, absolutely. So what these nodes are doing is something that is called data availability sampling. And basically, data availability sampling allows these light nodes to download around less than 1% of the block and guarantee that the entire block is valid. Hmm. And the more nodes that you have sampling this, the higher guarantee that you know that the block is there. So what this does is that it increases scalability and reduces the cost for users to operate nodes and verify the network. And as I mentioned earlier, the more nodes there are, the more capacity the network has. So I think a really good uh, example of this, so stepping back a little bit, data availability sampling uses something called erasure coding. And erasure coding is actually something that um, exists in CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, but I think a more tangible example, well, I guess for, in that case, um, if your CD is scratched, it might still play the music on it, but only to a certain degree. Uh, if there's too many scratches, you're not going to be able to guess what was there. I think a good example that is more tangible is with a QR code. So the QR code on the left, if you have your phone out, you can scan it, and it's going to take you to the Celestia docs. And I've actually removed a pretty large portion of the one on the right, and it's going to be able to do the same thing for you. So this is using erasure coding, and we're basically able to guarantee with a small bit, well, almost a majority of this QR code, and we're going to get to the same place. 
That is beautiful. And for folks wondering about the implications of this, if you're understanding it for the first time, you could just take your thumb and cover different parts of the left one. It's not like there was a specific part you're allowed to do this for. What he's yeah. saying is that there's a holographic nature to the way the information's encoded so that the whole is existing across the parts. And when you, um, unlike a URL, right? If it just said like yep. celestia.org forward slash docs, if I covered the right part, you would be unable to know what it said. But it's not yep. like that. Each of the parts, yeah, I'm not going to pretend I understand how to explain holograms super well, but I think it's a beautiful <laughs> execution of a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where did this all come from? I, I think that's important to understand. So if you want to read more into data availability sampling, uh, what you can do, I'll be able to, I can send links after this, uh, or you can look up these papers. Uh, but there's a paper by Mustafa, who is our founder, and Vitalik, um, and Ismail, and Alberto, who wrote about fraud and data availability proofs, detecting invalid blocks and light clients. And then another one that I think is useful to read into if you want to get into the details is the actual, the, the original paper for Celestia, which is called Lazy Ledger, uh, Distributed Data Availability Ledger with Client-Side Smart Contracts. And that's written by Mustafa. And uh, yeah, if you have more questions, please reach out to me after. So taking a step back a little bit, I want to go over what the real benefits of building on Celestia are. So foremost, we have scalability. The more transaction, we are able to verify more transactions as the number of nodes increases, which means we can have bigger blocks. Um, I think bridging is probably one of the biggest problems in the blockchain world. Uh, there's been countless hacks, uh, and a lot of these are because the base security layers are different. So you cannot inherit the same security for two different rollups unless they're built on the same se shared security layer. Well, moreover, like if you're trying to bridge between two completely separate L1s, like Gnosis Chain and Ethereum Mainnet, for example, that bridge has the security of neither. It just has the security yeah. of the bridge, which which are notoriously yeah. not as robust as the networks themselves. Absolutely. And which need a lot of liquidity to be able to function effectively as a bridge. So people are just like, I'll go put my ETH in this bridge <laughs> contract. It's between ETH Mainnet and Gnosis Chain. What's the problem? And it's like, oh, there was some underflow exploit in the bridge itself. Oopsies. Yep. <laughs> so that's one of the bigger problems uh, we're working on solving. Uh, and actually, I guess if you're familiar with the Cosmos ecosystem, this is something that something called inter blockchain communication enables between Cosmos chains, but there's still not the same security guarantees between those different validator sets. And the validator sets are what make up the shared security layer. Mm. So I think the third benefit here is sovereignty. And what that really means is the flexible choice to pick your execution environment. So you could use the Fuel VM to build a rollup. You could use the EVM to build a rollup. You could use the Solana VM. You could make a JavaScript VM, Move VM. So basically, we want people to be able to build what they need. And all we're doing is providing them the security to do that. Well, not all we're doing, but that's the main thing that, that we're doing here. So um, I want to highlight a little bit about the shared security aspect of this by using these diagrams. Um, in a monolithic layer one chain, you have to actually build your own security. So building your own security is setting up that whole validator network that validates the network. But in the modular world, whether we're building on Celestia or another DA layer, we're able to inherit security from day one. So as soon as I start my rollup, I'm receiving that security. There's definitely a few more steps there, but um, you're able to start up a network without having to bootstrap that entire validator set. And then splitting apart the functions of the blockchain a little bit here, uh, we can see in the monolithic example uh, we're just going to use execution, consensus, and data availability all in the same chain. And in the modular um, paradigm, we're 
going to use a common shared security layer on the bottom and then have execution separated. They're going to be connected, but they're not coupled together. So this allows us to reduce bottlenecks and really focus on just the execution side of things. So we're going to be going through an example here in a little bit, and we're going to be building a sovereign rollup. A sovereign rollup is a rollup that has execution and settlement in one layer and then shared security in another layer. I want to pause for any questions. And if there are none, I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> well, I think we'll need to get to the end for my question to have all of the room to breathe. My question, which we will punt until the end, is cool. Wh so why aren't we just doing rollups on ETH mainnet? Like, haven't we already architected a solution to this to improve transaction throughput while like inheriting the security of everyone's favorite ETH mainnet, like ETH Maxis yep. Unite? So. Uh, you know, I, I want to understand what you're saying so that I can understand the right column, for example, because I think you're hinting at an answer that includes ETH mainnet for everyone who loves ETH mainnet. Absolutely. So um, I'll let you continue. But that that's sort of the elephant in the room for me, which is like, we already have the shared security layer we love, and we're already working on using rollups to improve execution and settlement. So in what sense is this similar or different? Uh, Absolutely. But I'll let you continue. I think... I guess I should note um, Celestia orders transaction data and makes it available. There's nothing else going on. Uh, so really, I think the most simple form of a blockchain. Uh, and this really just helps reduce the bottlenecks that happen on Ethereum mainnet. I think if you want to, yeah, we'll get into that later. Um, and I think the blog post actually can explain it better than I can for Celestiums. Mm -hmm. So what is a sovereign rollup? A sovereign rollup is a rollup that doesn't use a separate settlement layer. And this allows developers to have the freedom to choose their execution environment and not share resources like you would share in another execution environment, such as building on one chain. Um, yeah. So <laughs> how can I build this? That's probably what you're wondering. What do you and mean no settlement layer? It's, no shared um, settlement layer, rather. Yeah, no shared settlement layer. Uh, basically, the settlement happens within the execution layer. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep going. Yeah, we're we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um. So Rollkit is the way that you would build this, and Rollkit is a modular framework for rollups. So what this allows you to do is build your own rollup on top of a shared security layer, and Really, the possibilities are endless there. But what this looks like in practice is each one of these could be a roll kit roll up that is built on top of Celestia. It could also be built on another DA layer. And the configuration under the hood, uh, what we're able to do is choose our execution environment, uh, whether it's the Cosmos SDK, whether it's the EVM, or Cosmosm, or Fuel VM. We're able to set up different types of sequencer sets. Uh, so these could be a centralized sequencer. It could be decentralized leader selection or sequencer as a service even. We can also have staking options that we basically configure to whatever use case we need. And then we also have different ways that you can add proof schemes. Uh, so fraud proofs, zero knowledge proofs, or I guess in the pessimistic option, no proofs at all. So let's get to building a little bit here. I think this might help everyone understand a little bit better about what's going on. And then we'll come back for questions a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So I guess starting out, I'm going to show you what we're actually going to be looking at here. So one of the first projects I did on BuildSpace was something called a Wave Portal. Uh, the project left room for a little bit of creativity. Uh, so what I built then was a Veggie Portal, and that was built on, uh, I think it was on Rinkaby at the time. 
But basically, it was the first time I put a smart contract out there, uh, and I was able to actually interact with that on the front end, and it kind of blew my mind at the time. So what we're doing here is we're actually connecting to an Ethermit rollup, which is an EVM-compatible uh, rollup that's running on top of Celestia. Uh, I think that I've probably already posted from this account, but it looks like I haven't. So what we're going to do now is we're sending a transaction and it's going to post a GM on the wall, but I think it failed because I've already posted. Yeah. We're going to swap the contract out and do the full demo here in a second. So what we were just looking at is a full stack Ethermit. Uh, I guess demo. Uh, the smart contract is living on an Ethermint rollup that's posting data to Celestia. And Should I know what Ethermint is? Uh, I guess not. Um, Ethermint is a Cosmos SDK compa like it's built with the Cosmos SDK and it's an EVM basically an EVM um, Cosmos SDK chain that's compatible with the Cosmos ecosystem, and also with the EVM. And when I say with, compatible with the EVM, it's running the EVM so you can use traditional tooling like MetaMask and all that stuff. You uh, can write your smart contract in Solidity. Itself. Yeah, and oh, then okay. Solidity, yeah. OK. So cool. Thank you for asking, actually. So over here on the right, um, actually, we'll start with this. Um, so the dependencies for this are a Celestia light node, which is something that you can run on your laptop. Uh, we also have a local Celestia devnet that you can run similarly to how you run um, Hardhat or Truffle, where you have a local network to mm -hmm. test things out before you go to a test net that's actually out there. Um, we're also going to have a roll kit Ethermint node. And this node is a sequencer. So what it's doing is it's taking in transactions and ordering them and then producing a block and posting that block to Celestia. We're going to have a Solidity smart contract in the project. And the front end is built with Vite.js Rainbow Kit. Huge Rainbow Kit fan. Um, Shout out to Rainbow Kit. Yeah, and Chakra UI. Uh, and Chakra UI is a component library that makes building front ends easy. Um, I guess one of the things that I really like about it is that it has dark mode built in like pretty easily. So you can uh, make it developer friendly if you want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Developers who famously hate light. Yeah, it's, it's not an option. Um, so the site that we're, we were looking at before is actually deployed on Fleek. Uh, so it's hosted on IPFS and I'm actually using an ENS, uh, an ETH limo to reach site right now. I don't know what those words mean. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> what that means is I have an Ethereum name service, uh, name here mm -hmm. and I have pointed uh, the site that is living on uh, the interplanetary file system, so a decentralized data storage network. And it's like a, like a blockchain, but more like a Google Drive. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And what we have on the naming service, like we would have a domain name service, is we're pointing the address to the IPFS file or the hash there. And uh, eth.limo is a way that you can access this on a normal web browser. Um, if I were to go to Brave, I think you can, we'll do it later, but I could also just type in buildmarket.eth and it would show up. I put a QR code up on the stream here that will take folks to uh, buildmarket.eth.limo, which I just nice. loaded up and it turns out is live. And uh, yep. and you can even cover a corner of that QR code with your thumb, and it'll still work. Yeah, 
<laughs> Someone scanned it. Alana, did you scan it? That's fun. Nice. We'll figure out a way how to. I'm going to get you tokens if you want to play around with it uh, at the end of this, but we're going to deploy a new contract first. Cool. So the dependencies for this um, are relatively low. We're going to be. The, the recommendation is to have eight gigabytes of RAM, a uh, quad core CPU, and around 250 gigs of storage. Uh, for That's bandwidth. That's not a cell phone, my guy. That's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to be running. We're going to be running. Um, this is a medium node. Both a light node and then the roll kit node. Uh, so I guess the 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 dependencies here are a little bit uh, conservative in that sense. Okay. Uh, same and with the bandwidth. You don't need bandwidth that high, uh, but yeah, this is the recommendation. For, yeah, high tall order. Um, yeah. so what am I? It, I guess. Because when other people a, run nodes, they get like ETH or whatever. So like, am I at least yeah. getting some Celeste? Like, how do I? Yeah, not not really. If you're running a light node, uh -huh. um, the light node is basically just the way to allow the end user to inherit that security. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important to note that we don't have a light node running in production on a cell phone, um, but it has been done, I think, around, I want to say this time last year, Mustafa ran one on an Android, and it was able to be doing data availability sampling on that phone. So I want to get into it. Um, sure, sure. I guess it's important to note, I tested out a local DevNet along with an Ethernet rollup running on I think it was one gigabyte of memory, 25 gigs of storage, and a single core CPU. Uh, and this was in a virtual machine on DigitalOcean. But it was able to do that and run the whole entire local DA network and then also run the rollup on top of it. So it came with lower resources, but um, just more of a recommendation than anything. So the first thing uh, we're going to do here, we're going to set up the actual chain before we go into the smart contract. Uh, and please let me know if I should zoom in a little bit. OK, so what we're going to do. Good. Yeah, cool. So the first thing that we're going to do is clone the repository. I've already done that. I'm on uh, relatively slow Wi-Fi right now. Uh, and we're going to install the binary or the daemon that is going to be running that chain. So you can think of this as a software that is the node. And I've actually already installed it. Uh, so I'm just going to verify that I have that there. We're going to get the nice CLI menu that tells us everything that's going on. And in order to initialize the chain, uh, we have a fun, I'm going to switch to a new chat tab here. have this init script that's going to do all of the work that we don't want to type in one by one. But basically what we're doing here is setting the chain ID. And this is actually a chain ID that's both compatible with Cosmos SDK, which is what Celestia is built with, or the network, the underlying network is built with. And this chain ID 9000 is actually what's going to be used for uh, the EVM side of things. I'm not going to go through every line of this. Um, this is in the repository if you want to look deeper to know what's going on. But basically, we're setting up the chain. Uh, we're setting up the Genesis file that starts the chain. And then we're making sure we don't have any existing versions there. And what this is doing is just setting the foundation so that we can start the chain. We're going to be making. Um, basically creating some tokens that are what we're going to use uh, to send transactions on the chain, uh, similar to what we saw um, in the MetaMask wallet a little bit ago. Questions? No. Cool. Um, so in this example, we're going to run a local DA network just to get started. 
Uh, I'm using Docker, which basically allows us to have that running in a container so I don't have any conflicts with dependencies that are actually like on my local machine. And we're going to get this started. Uh, it should pull it from the GitHub container registry. And it'll start up in a second. So we can see we have a Celestia address there. And what we can do to verify that we're actually able to post blocks to this is checking the balance. Um, so we can see that we have, this is in UTS, so micro, so we have around 99 million tokens on this um, the, the node that we're going to be posting transactions to. So if we, what we need to do in order to get the rollup started is we select a random namespace ID. So you can think of this as just a place that the data is going to be going on Celestia. And then we also want to know what block height this data availability layer is at. So this set of commands here is going to pull the names, uh, create a random namespace ID and pull the block height. So it's going to be around 71 right now. And since we're running this locally, that's going to be very quick. And what we can do to start the actual Ethernet rollup is drop this in. I have tutorials on all of this as well um, that we'll link at the end of this so you can dive into the details on your own. And uh, if you have questions, uh, please reach out. So what we're doing here is we are starting the daemon. We are specifying that we're using Rollkit and a DA layer that is Celestia. We're setting the base URL for Celestia as this network that's running here. We're setting a timeout and gas limit as well. And then in order to post these blocks to Celestia, we're basically setting the fee and that is in UTIA. So the balance that we checked just a minute ago, that's what we're going to be spending to post these blocks to Celestia. The namespace ID is also something that we just set. And we have to specify the, heart, the DA start height in order to start posting to the right place. So we're going to start that chain. Um, and now we can actually get into the fun part, which is the smart contract and the front end. So you can see that we have block height one being committed to Celestia. Uh, we're going to actually wait a second to see that go through. And we also see that we started at DA, uh, DA height of 146. So we can see that we submitted a block to the DA layer. And we have that commit hash uh, that basically is the proof that that block was posted. Hmm. So what we're going to want to do to deploy the contract is pull the private key that is running on that sequencer. And we're going to be using a Cosmos SDK command uh, to export that key and set it as a variable. And what this is going to allow us to do is use the tokens in that um, in the Ethermint rollup and actually deploy a contract and pay the gas to deploy that contract. So taking a step back, I have a wave portal contract that we're going to be using to allow people to wave or send to GM. And if you've done projects, this is probably familiar for you. Basically, we are recording the address of the user who GM'd or waved. We're setting the message that they sent. And then we're also going to keep a timestamp of that so that we can see uh, when you GM'd. And what we're doing is we're storing that in an array and then mapping that. And also, we're recording how many times someone has waved. So this is going to basically prevent people from spamming the wall. Um, but yeah. We're going to go ahead and deploy this. 
And to do that, we're going to be using Foundry. Um, Foundry is similar to Hard Hat if you've used Hard Hat. Uh, and I honestly just, just like it. So right now we're running this command in the directory that this contract lives in. And we're deploying it to uh, port 8545, which is the RPC for this Ethermint EVM chain. And we're using the private key that we set already. And we're not in the right place. Could not canonicalize the target path. Yeah, I know. Oh, well, yeah, that's how oh, I feel no. every day. Yep. So. Okay. Well, we're in front end. Did yeah, you we're say in we need front to end. In the source? We're not in. We're supposed to be in the contracts directory. This is one of the situations where it worked on my machine. <laughs> All right, so we're in the right directory now. Uh, uh -huh. We're going to run this command to run the deployment script that's going to broadcast the contract to the EVM network. And this time, we're going to see a receipt Here we go. in a few seconds that this contract was compiled. We can see that we have chain ID 9000. We can see the gas. We can also see the amount of ETH required to deploy this. And now we have a contract address that shows that was deployed. But what we want to do to make sure that that is you know, actually working is send a GM to that in the CLI and then verify that we actually got that GM. So first, I'm going to set the contract address to the contract that I just copied out of the output. And we're going to use Foundry again to send a GM using the private key that deployed the contract. It could be any private key, though, that holds tokens on this chain. And we're going to send a GM to the RPC URL, which is the same one that's where the EVM is running. So it's going to take a second to go through. But right now, it's interacting with the contract. It's paying gas for that. And ultimately, we're going to get a response that shows there is some hex data that was written to that contract. Uh, and we're going to be able to pull the number of waves that have been sent to that with by calling get total waves on mm -hmm. the contract. So we can see now, whoops, wrong one. We can see now that the transaction has gone through. I'm going to start from the top. We have the block hash. We have the block number, which looks like seven, which is accurate. We also have the total amount of gas used and the gas price. And then we have some logs of hex data, uh, not that important. But we also have a transaction hash. And now that block 12 has spun out, what we can do is actually query this contract and see how many total waves there are. Now, cool, that worked. But what if I want to send another transaction? So if we remember in the contract, I set it up so that you can't GM more than once per day. So if I try to do that again, it's going to tell me that this address is already waived. Um, I think this is something that just highlights uh, the beauty of smart contracts, where we're able to turn things into code that might not normally be that way. Um, I know we're coming up on time here, so I don't want to go too far, but I think the next thing I was going to do is uh, deploy that to an EVM rollup that's running out in the cloud and the one that's actually running the chain on the website. So just want to get a temperature check there. Uh, yes, I would love to see you do that cool. because some of those pieces I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, the secret of these of the streaming is that even if no one comes, I get to learn a bunch of stuff. So cool. All right. Yeah, we're hanging out. Yeah. Um, so we have this chain running on our computer, but we're kind of done with it. Um, I think I'm ready to push something to a live network. And first I'm gonna go ahead and stop the Docker container that's running that and not open Steam. 
Oops. Okay. And I'm going to use Docker stop to do that. It'll take a second. Um, but I'm also going to go ahead and stop the Ethernet chain up there. You can actually see as I stop the Celestia data availability client, uh, we see that output in the Ethernet side of things. Um, so yeah, we're good to go. I'm going to actually kill this window and we're going to play around over here. So I'm using a cloud VM here. So this is a virtual machine that's running Linux. And I'm using DigitalOcean. I think if you're getting started with cloud infrastructure, that's a pretty safe way to go um, if you don't need things that are too robust. Is it more? Um, is it have a better developer experience than something like a Amazon or Google version of the same? I mean, personally, I think so, but I have not actually played around too much with either AWS or GCP. Mm -hmm. um, but I know in terms of the learning curve, it was a lot, um, I guess, less steep than what I've experienced uh, with playing around with AWS when I was learning for the certification. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like, yeah, if you're just getting started with a VM, like that's probably the way to go. Um, and really, just if you want to be able to start something up and not actually manage your own server at home, I think this is a good way to go. So what we have here is, well, right now we're logged in to this box and I'm using something called Tmux, which basically allows me to have terminal instances persist even if I log out of the VM. So we're going to see a, a bunch of more blocks like spinning through this one, but I'll explain a little bit about what's going on. So at the top here, we have a Celestia DA light node running, and it is running on the Mocha testnet. Um, so the Mocha testnet is our first testnet, and it's live. This node is running. The node is also funded, so it has testnet tokens, which allows you to submit transactions to the DA network through the light node. On the bottom, we have the Ethermint chain running. Um, I've had this one going for a while now, so it is at block height 39,000 and some change. Yeah, 39,300. And we can see that we're posting blocks to Celestia. And that's basically the stack there. Um, these two nodes are running an EVM network and we're going to be posting to that. So over here, um, we're going to go ahead and just check the balance on the light node. So I have around 170 TIA. And what that does is it allows me to post data to Celestia. Um, so what we're going to do is actually set private key again, which that was the other window I had open. Hold on a second. Can I stop my share for like, yeah, here, I'll yeah, take it down 10 seconds. Yeah, I took it off. It's a burner, but um, yeah. yeah, it's a best practice. You just let me know when you want me to put it back. Thank you. Meantime, in the meantime, y'all can queue up your okay. questions. One second. All right, cool. Ready to go over here. Okay, I'm going to bring it back up. Boom. Cool. So we're actually still on my local machine. Uh, we're going to be using the same contract as before. Uh, and what we're going to do here is deploy the same contract. But this time, we're going to deploy it to this network that's running out in the cloud. So what I'm able to do is use the same command as before, but I've swapped out the RPC URL to be the IP address of the virtual machine that I have running out there. Uh, so if all goes according to plan, this should work. We've compiled 
the contract. Um, it's actually one that I've compiled here before. We can see the logs that I am a smart contract. Shout out Farza um, from BuildSpace. This is where the contract is from. And we can see that it's being deployed to chain ID 9000, which is the same chain ID that's running over here. And um, we're still sending that transaction. It's going to take a little bit of time to confirm. Um, I guess one of the misconceptions with rollups, at least the way they're built right now, is that they make things faster. It's not always true. Um, and we're playing around with ways to make the user experience better on that front. Um, but at the end of the day, we do have to make sure that we avoid malicious actors in the network who might produce fraud. Hmm. So we've got that contract deployed. We have a contract address that we can call um, as a proof of concept. I'm going to go ahead and set that contract address here. We're going to actually just call it from the CLI right now. And we're going to send a GM the same way that we did last time. So again, not necessarily super fast yet, but this is calling the contract that's living on the Ethermint chain here that's posting data to one of our Celestia testnets. And in the meantime, while we're waiting on that, I'm going to go ahead and close out of these contract things and actually swap the contract address out. So what I'm doing here on my front end is changing the contract address. And at the same time, what you always want to remember to do is to swap out the ABI. And the ABI is the application binary interface. And basically what that does is it allows you to actually communicate with the smart contract on the front end. And um, all the functions on the contract that are there. Uh, it basically just helps the front end communicate with the smart contract. Maybe not in the best of fashion. They swapped it out, but it's, it's going to work. I don't know if copy pasting is the right way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, we have a new contract address in here. So what I want to do is um, actually I want to change into my front end directory first because I have everything in the same repository. Um, in the meantime, we're actually going to check back to see if that went through and it looks like it did. There we go. So at block number 39,000 on the DA layer, which uh, that um, seems about right. Looks good to me. And we can see the gas that was used. We can see the logs. And really the important thing, we have that transaction hash and we know that the transaction itself went through. Hmm. So what we're going to do now, again, um, we're going to check the number of GMs. Uh, I guess it might have made sense to check that before, but we can see that we have one. And we've already copied the ABI on the front end. So now what we can do is make sure that everything is installed in terms of dependencies on the front end. And these are all of the modules that build up the front end. Uh, so Ch Chakra UI is installing right now. Um, hopefully this doesn't take too long, but in the meantime, uh, Derek or anyone else, I guess if you have questions, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Shout out to time. Juan Geraldo. Uh, welcome back, Juan. What's our tech stack for the front end? I'm here in React. I'm here in yep. Chakra UI. Is that basically it? And then what are we using? Like Ethers JS? Or... Yeah. So I'm actually I'm using Rainbow Kit. Um, I guess I do have Ethers JS. Yep, I have Ethers running, or yeah, Ethers JS uh, imported as well. Uh, in terms of other dependencies, uh, um, yeah, Wagme is being used by Rainbow Kit, and at the core of it, it's like I would like to think it's a relatively not too clunky front end. I don't have much going on here. 
I have some buttons at the top. In terms of design or in terms of the complexity of the stack? Uh, in terms of, of complexity of the stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we got React. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love building really with V8. It's quick. Um, it Go works. It. Yeah. yeah. But um, in terms of styling, I'm using Chakra UI. I'm using Rainbow Kit. Um, but the main things that are allowing us to talk to the smart contract and interact with the smart contract are Ethers, mm -hmm. Wagme, and Rainbow Kit. Mm -hmm. Which would be true regardless of the chain or the user's wallet, basically. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do here now that everything is installed is start that local instance of this website. Or front end. And this looks the same as the one online, but the only difference here is going to be that the account that I'm going to, or the contract is different. So we're not going to see all the GMs that we saw last time. But what we can see is that the GM that we posted from the command line using Foundry did go through, and um, we can see that on the wall here. So I guess. So even though the front end is running on your local machine, uh, can you explain how? Like, because it sounds like you're reading from the Ethermint. Um, Correct. Chain. And that. Okay. Yeah, that's so, not on my machine. Right. So can uh, you I am, spell it out how these are connected? Yeah. So basically, um, I think I need to take a step back. So. <laughs> Right now, um, this local site is the RPC, um, so the endpoint that we're using to reach Ethermint is live. Um, it's actually out there in the wild. And this local site is communicating with that Ethermint chain, the EVM chain, and it has the contract ABI. So it's able to read from that contract. It's also to, able to create posts on that contract. Um, and actually what we can do in the meantime is just to show that this can also go live is um, commit this to the main branch and it will rebuild on IPFS. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll come back here and reload that. But basically, um, Did that explain it well enough? Does that have, wait, sorry, just as a small question. Does that have continuous deployment to IPFS? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. I guess that was the other fun part of this that I wanted to get into um, if we had time. Uh, so this site is deployed on Fleek, uh, which is something that Protocol Labs is building. And basically Fleek is uh, something similar to Vercel mm -hmm. uh, where you can host websites. But the fun part about it is that it's, uh, posted on the Web3 version of Google Drive, uh, IPFS. I don't want to... There's also other services out there, but Fleek uh, put, puts this all together. Really, uh, So we're actually able to use a domain name server. So I'm using GM portal XYZ, so we can reach it at that address. We can also reach it in S. So... Where's my browser? So if we go here, we're going to see this GM portal. Um, since it's actually a different URL than what I was on before, we're going to connect to the chain again. And it is not updated yet. Uh, we'll check back in a minute. But before we do that, I think it's important to poke around a little bit on here. Um, so. I have this deployed on Fleek. Ooh. We can see that there is a deploy that was deployed in a minute and 33 seconds just a few minutes ago. And we also can, no, can't scroll. We can see that this site is deployed on a few places. So let's say you don't have a DNS or an ENS, you can have it deployed for free. And this is using Fleek's domain name servers. We can also deploy it to a regular domain. But the fun part is uh, deploying it to ENS. Mm -hmm. 
So what we can do here is not get there. It's loading. But um, the, the easier way to get to that using ENS is to use eth.limo. And if you want to learn more about that, um, you can read about it on the site. Wow. I almost don't want to wait on this, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my only question is, why did you use GitHub instead of Radical? Uh, good question. <laughs> That's like, you know, the next thing that we'll add to this. To For those here. who don't get the joke, we're in the context of pushing more and more of the pieces of web app development into decentralized versions of Web2 services. So the, um, the node, for example, is running on DigitalOcean, which is essentially like an Amazon web server type of um, virtual machine. You can like rent out some of the cloud and have it do computation for you. Um, and the, what, what is IPFS doing? The data available, the front end? It serves up yeah. the code for the front end? So it's serving the front end. Um, I, we're going to actually go, because we, I guess we're just hanging out. We're going to go and uh, uh, build market. Uh, it's going to want me to use that RPC. So if we go here on S, we can actually see that we have a pointer on IPNS to that basically connects this really long definitely not human readable hash into something that is human readable. Uh, really the same way that we don't use IP addresses to go to mm -hmm. Twitter. So I guess I have this set up to use Cloudflare, but the easier way to reach that is to use eth.limo. And actually, if you're using something like Brave, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to see that little IPFS uh, link in the top that'll take you directly to that file. Wow. However, it's typically kind of slow, and I'm on um, hotel Wi-Fi right now. So, sure. And welcome we'll give to it decentralized second. technologies. Oh. <laughs> um, they're famously not fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so on that note, I guess the part that wasn't too slow is we have this GM portal, and we've swapped the contract out. We're on a live website, and I'm going to go ahead and since I've already posted from this account, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect from it and switch to another one. And what we're going to do here is actually interact with the contract using uh, MetaMask instead of using the CLI. And I'll make it less confusing by getting rid of the other version of this. So ETH Denver is coming up. We're going to GM to ETH Denver because we're too excited to wait. And we're going to see that we're going to spend about a 10,000th, two 10,000th. Uh, yeah, a really small amount of gas on this. And apparently I've already GM today, so that's not good. But <laughs> All of these gonna, accounts. Yep. <laughs> You're just um, GMing everywhere you go. I guess so. Um, I don't want to get too stuck in the weeds here, but it would be nice to... Oh, no. Not a good day for that, I guess. Uh, maybe it's not worth it. Uh, we'll see. So that was the demo. Um, we're going to... Yeah, I think the... We're going to still try for one, though. But yeah, yeah. as you do, I'm going to talk through the the stack because in a conversation around modular blockchains the the part that's conceptually new and challenging for me at least is understanding in the old paradigm what service does each piece of you know you've got serving me a front end so i can see it on my computer you've got interacting with my wallet you've got sending a transaction from my wallet to some kind of node whether it's an RPC that's a third-party service or whether it's a node I'm running on my own machine or whether it's a node I'm running on some virtual machine somewhere else. And then you've got the actual uh, execution and then the storage and data availability once that's all done. And then 
reading that from the blockchain and then bringing it back to the front end to show that there's been some update. That's a lot of pieces. And so one or to, two to compare this to <laughs> how things usually go. Let me, let's my check my own understanding. Mm -hmm. If I were a day one build space dev, I would probably learn how to make a front end with react mm -hmm. that uses something like ethers JS or rainbow kit to talk to the wallet. If I had a MetaMask wallet, then MetaMask is under the hood talking to mm -hmm. Infura or some other RPC to yep. uh, send the transaction from my computer through that node over to the blockchain to, mm -hmm. to queue it up as something that's trying to get in the next block. And this is a conversation between many nodes. That's the whole point of the decentralized network is lots of nodes working together to arrive at some consensus about what happens in the next block. And then they decide together what happens. And then that data is stored in the block, which we then use MetaMask again, back to our front end, back to our machine. We're using, uh, we're like querying and saying, hey, there we go. Uh, we're saying, hey, oh, what happened? Did my Uniswap swap go through? We look at the blockchain, the, probably through some third party thing. And we say, yep. yes, that data availability is there. Here's the new thing. Okay, great. And then we show it on our front end. Yep. So we've got a bunch of pieces there. Uh, in this version, we have a couple things that are the same. Same wallet, for example, still MetaMask. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but, and, and the front end still written in React, but mm -hmm. in this example, this was optional. It has nothing to do with Celestia, was hosted yeah. on IPFS. Correct. Um, which was pointing to a GitHub repo that you'd put. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I, I found it interesting. Th this is like a subtlety that I think is one of those. There's like, a lot of moving parts. The, the, one of the gotchas. Um, similar to like one of the more important gotchas, which is like, there's no, nothing is ever in your wallet. That is not how mm -hmm. wallets work. Uh, right. We can get into that later, but in a similar way, um, when you go to a website such as Uniswap or GM portal, mm -hmm. it's not that the website talks to the blockchain. The okay. website is sort of preparing information to go through your wallet to the blockchain or more accurately Correct. from your wallet to an RPC node to the blockchain. And so the big, that's why I was surprised you could run it from localhost, but go talk to an actual mm -hmm. node that's running on testnet. I was like, Oh, that's right. The front end doesn't actually do the work here. It's the wallet that's doing the work as yep. it talks to the node. So in that sense, I wanted to zoom in because that's where it feels like we're at the new piece. We queue up a transaction yep. in the wallet from the GM portal, sign a message to send your GM. Okay. I have my MetaMask, I click sign, and then I want to slow down because this is the part I'm not sure I get. That gets sent it, where it would normally go like straight to Infura or something or like mm -hmm. to Pocket or QuickNote or whatever. Now it's going to... Um, it's going to that EVM rollup and let's say that both of us posted... Like, how how do block. I set that up in my MetaMask? Is that like a unique... Yeah, network? so... It is a unique network. Okay, um, that makes sense. And so I'm putting in the it, RPC, in this case, the exact URL of the instance that you've deployed on DigitalOcean. Yeah, in this case, actually, um, I have it set up so that uh, Rainbow Kit is going to suggest that you add a chain. It's then going to prompt you in your MetaMask wallet to add that chain and then switch to that chain. So if you were to go to the chat or... I you guess can scan go through the QR code right here to try it out yourself. Yep. This there is live. Go. Nice. Um, oh, sure enough. I'll you can to connect to that chain. Here, yeah. I think what I could do is leave a private key that has some tokens in it. That's a burner. If anyone wants to uh, go ahead and try that out. Interesting. But you on, and now I can see I, that. I, or you can DM me and I'll send you tokens, I guess. Okay. That's probably the easier way. So... I don't want to encourage bad security practice. <laughs> no. no, pasting private keys in chat. Yeah, no, we're good. Um, it's like an Easter egg or something. So what if we... What have we gained? 
like what was the Surreal. main benefit of structuring like i'm a dev this is evm compatible mm-hmm. what have i gained compared to throwing this on eth mainnet uh an, e- an evm compatible roll-up that's already on eth mainnet such as zk sync um or some other l1 that has enough decentralization to fit my use case such as gnosis chain why would i yeah. do things this way so uh to be transparent this example is not necessarily something that you'd be able to take and go start a dex roll up or anything like that you'd still need to set up a network of full nodes and sequencer and light nodes that actually make that roll up network work but to zoom out a little bit um the way that this could be used by someone uh let's say you want to build a gaming roll up what you could do is set up your own chain on top of Celestia that uses the EVM. So you're able to use familiar tooling like MetaMask and Rainbow Kit and all that fun stuff, um, but really only focus on that game in the execution layer. So instead of having a network that has a lot of other smart contracts on it, you could make this your own special rollup. And basically that allows you to reduce the amount of resources that you're sharing with other people. Not that sharing is bad, but if we're all trying to use the same layer, it basically, no, I don't want sunflower the- land yeah. <laughs> using up all the stuff on polygon and ruining yeah, the fun so for everybody. <laughs> if I have my Josh game and Derek, you have your game. Um, we're going to want to split those up probably so that we don't use the same resources. And so that I don't hog your resources and you don't hog mine. Um, but Specifically, the no, the full nodes resources. Um, yeah. So let's say that we. I, I'm not going to actually use real numbers, but basically, if we're both trying to use the same chain for, let's say, two different games, uh, and this game has like a really big, like high volume in transactions it's going to cause like one of our chains to be a lot slower. It also makes the, the transaction costs go up um, and ultimately just throughput slows down. So if we are both trying to run a game on the same rollup or something like that, that's going to slow things down. So the real like benefit of this is that you can have your own um, like sovereign community that where you can focus on the core functions of whatever you're building and really like only do that. Yeah, I'm, I know you've drawn some analogies to Cosmos, for example, I'm actually comparing it to my understanding of Avalanche, which I learned a little bit okay. recently and how they, yeah. they play a game where like they can also have different virtual machines. You could have move, you could have fuel, you could have EVM, whatever you want. And then the validators, um, are eligible for certain criteria, like whether or not yeah. they're KYC, for example, or whether or not they're in a certain mm-hmm. geographical area or disclose that at all. And so you can set your requirements of what you need out of validators. And then the validators sort of, this might be not exactly how it works. Like we'll take turns validating different things that they're yeah. eligible for. And in this way, like a variety of virtual machines are like maintained by this like overlapping mesh of validators and it's a little messier whereas my i mean your visuals at least seem to on the slides seem to imply more so that there was like a more like monolithic security layer where sort Mm -hmm. of every every validator every full node is in like lockstep with each other yeah Um, so i guess the important thing there is in like both the Avalanche case and Cosmos case, and I just want to preface this with this might not be 100% accurate, but you're going to have to actually spin up an entire validator set. Um, in the Cosmos world, this basically is around 100 to 150 validators that you need to coordinate. That requires like a massive amount of social coordination, but also like a large amount of technical coordination to do. Um, and then the real like thing there is that these are isolated so that you don't have the same security between each of those chains. Uh, I think I'll probably not go back to the slides right now, but uh, 
you basically have all of these different blockchains that are isolated. Whereas if you build on top of a common shared security layer, you're able to all be in the same network. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's the trade-off um, yeah. that I, the more I learn about scaling, which is sort of one of mm -hmm. the eras we're in, like there's enough demand. Now let's talk about solving the scalability trilemma. I, yeah. I can, I can see this as a solution. Like let's make it possible for these execution environments to be separate so that they don't interfere with each other. And yet when the rollups settle their data, that's on a shared layer so that when you do a swap on Uniswap, even if it's its own chain, the results at the end of the day are stored here so that other dApps have access to that data and can use it. So from the user experience, it's all available. It might as well, might as well all be one L1, even though yeah. there's like a pretty different architecture over on the like execution side of how we yeah. got to the place of like the shared data across the dApps. Yeah. It's definitely, um, definitely pretty complicated. I think um, it took, it's taken me a while to really wrap my head around this. So I want to add that if anyone does have questions, uh, please reach out. Um, I think our docs are a good place to start, both on the Celestia side and the Roll Kit side. Mm -hmm. And um, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just pull my slides up again because I have some QR codes there. That's good. That. If you can share your whole screen, um, that'll help prepare yeah. for my next joke, too. Bam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, I'm blocking the QR code a little I bit and we're know. fine. Yeah, um, yeah I just want to. Oh, go ahead. We've built, uh, we went through that. I want to actually add that the reason we hit that contract on MetaMask is I think I need to actually change the contract and swap the ABI out again, but um, not really 100% positive there. Uh, but if okay. you try it from another address, it will definitely work. I see. Um, so the resources that I'd recommend you checking out if you want to learn more we have a learn modular section on our website on celestia.org slash learn that will guide you through from a higher level and a little bit less technical than we just went through uh, really like what this whole modular blockchain paradigm looks like. But then if you want to go deeper, we have a build modular section on the Celestia docs that will walk you through the different ways that you can deploy rollups on Celestia and the different types of rollups that you can actually build. Um, I guess this is a little bit of like an alpha leak. Uh, we haven't really announced it publicly yet, but we have we have been working on something called Rollkit, which is basically the SDK or the framework that allows us to build a rollup that is able to communicate with the data availability layer, whether it's Celestia or something else. Um, so yeah, if you want to check out more about Rollkit, uh, some of the tutorials on Celestia will be moving there soon. Um, and we're really trying to build this as an open source framework for anyone to build rollups and embrace the new modular paradigm. I think we've already done a lot of Q and A. So mm -hmm. unless anyone has any pressing questions, we're going to skip to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm waiting for whatever you were going to ask, but if you want to contact me, uh, please reach out on Twitter or telegram. Uh, either one works for me. Um, and if you want to, yeah, I guess get more involved like in the Celestia ecosystem, Definitely join our Discord, ask questions, play around with the tutorials. If you run into bugs, please write a ticket. That's how we make them better. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any suggestions for things to add, that's always welcome as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, as a <laughs> snaps for self, as a teacher, wait, leave your screen. Um, as a teacher, I always thought more lectures should end in standing ovations. That very criminally few do, despite how good they hmm. are. Um, Cody on YouTube says thank you, um, folks. Dro drop some claps, drop some gratitude for Josh. This has been a tour de force, and we've covered a lot of ground. And he's still available as a resource to you as you go through the docs. 
Uh, Alana says standing ovations on uh, her side as well. Thank you, Alana, for the questions as well. And yeah. if you have any more, please reach out. Uh, thank you, Emperor 22 hour for joining us as well. Um, so I, I just want to point out that it's nice to get to know you. You said a moment ago that this is um, some pretty dense stuff. I forget your exact wording, but like, you know, we're digging into some pretty, pretty complex architecture. Like blockchain was already hard. And to understand yeah. what, Celest what Celestia is trying to do to address some of the problems blockchains are currently facing requires a fairly intermediate level understanding of where we are right now in the first place much yeah. less to understand how they go about implementing those solutions. Oh, even more yeah. gratitude mm -hmm. flowing in from Deadcoin and Grokroof. Hi, Grokroof. Um, but I just want to say it's nice to see you model, you, Josh, as somebody who is clearly excited about learning and sharing what you learn and education as a core value of yours. What I wanted to tease you about is that it's clear you like being on, on the cutting edge of stuff. You know, you don't like sitting on your hands on your laurels. You like learning. You're using yeah. Arc Browser. You're using Warp Terminal. You're using <laughs> Celestia. Um, there was another one. Yeah, you're using uh, IPFS to host your front ends. There's something about you that's just like shiny object syndrome, but in the most beautiful way of like, I want to learn the cool thing. I want to try it. And then if it's good, I'm going to use <laughs> it. And then I want to share. You're the quintessential early adopter. So I appreciate you being out I, here, like in the weeds, like with your machete going through the jungle, like getting <laughs> scratched up and then coming back and being like, oh, I wrote a few docs, come this way. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, trying to show way. people how to, right? You're just like completely covered in like grime in your safari outfit. Like you can deploy <laughs> your own roll up. It's easier than it sounds. <laughs> like it's pretty hard, but you're like, no, 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 trust me. Just copy paste. I wrote the doc. So I just appreciate how hard you're <laughs> it should working. Work. Right. It should work. It didn't. But like you could go open a ticket. Um, you know, it's it's nice. I, I appreciate your journey has been from, you know, mechanical engineering to restaurants <laughs> to yeah, wait, man, I should check out fun. the software stuff. What are websites? And yeah. you've come all the way here. And I, you know, I'm assuming you're not you're, you're somewhat early in your career. Like if you're lucky enough to live yeah. a long life, like you've been through a lot of stuff, even at your t a tender young age of, I want to say late twenties, early thirties. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that is why I wanted to celebrate you as a model of someone that is just curious and trying stuff and bouncing around and seeing what's fun and cool and just letting your own curiosity lead you into completely different industries, completely different skill sets in like essentially scaling at times nearly vertical learning curves where you're like, how do I, why isn't it working? <laughs> I, just, I installed a new browser, a new terminal to deploy on a new blockchain infrastructure using a new SDK. Why is it working? <laughs> no shit. It's not working. All of these things are new and haven't been tested with each other. If you want something that works, go run like Chrome and like just do an AWS and call it a day. But no, yeah. you're out here wanting to try new stuff because it's cool. I do like to play around with things. Um, so I guess I encourage you to do the same if you're curious. Um, you might end up in a pretty fun place. Yeah. So one last time um, for folks that are curious. Uh, could you go back a slide or two, the QR codes one? Please. Yeah. There we go. I encourage folks to... Um, at least open these, bookmark them, whatever you want to do. Just have them as resources. I hoard bookmarks, even though I won't be able to consume all the tasty information out there because I share that curiosity of yours. Um, I love learning. And even if I never deploy my own virtual machine on Celestia, it's exciting to know that this is one of the parts of our industry that smart people are figuring out and then nice people are doing their best to communicate. You know, it takes a whole team. And so I appreciate yeah. you for being here. I appreciate folks like Rock Groove and Alana, the Web3 girl. And, um, oh, Franz Dehan on YouTube says, can't scan the webcams in the way. We did it. We broke the QR code. It was nice. <laughs> so go back, <laughs> go back. I'll move our cameras. Franz, thank you for saying that. I'm going to move our cameras now. Yeah, I Bada think it's boom. like, maybe 20 percent that you can cover on these oh, okay. um but cool yeah um, so anyway thank you so much thank you so much derek um and thank you for the kind words 
if you will be at ETH Denver, I look forward to meeting you. And then anyone who attended, thanks for coming. Yeah. Likewise, thanks for being here. Um, thank you, Alana. Thank you, Franz. Thank you, Cockroof. Thank you, Deadcoin. Thank you, Emperor22R. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Juan Geraldo. If you want to go fast, go alone and use battle-tested Web2 services. But if you want to go far, go together and use things like IPFS and ENS and Radical and Warp and Arc and Celestia and ask for help in the right discords along the way. Thank you for joining us today, Josh. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I've had a blast. All right. Uh, Please join me in sending everyone off in the traditional way by saying bye. Bye.